glad to have you here today. I guess I should say just hello and welcome in case you're joining us at some time other than in the morning. We're really glad that you're with us today. We are uh, beginning to uh, discuss Mark 13. Uh, and so if you have a Bible or you want to be able to get one and follow along with us, we would invite you to do that now. Uh, we're looking at Mark 13 today because we are entering into a, a, a season that in our culture, in our society today, many people begin to think right after Thanksgiving or even earlier, hey, Christmas is coming and it's the Christmas season. But for Christians, it's really the Advent season leading up to Christmas. And so we're going to begin to talk about Advent today. And we're going to do that over the next several Sundays. And we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 13 for the next several Sundays. So I invite you to, to find that if you're not able to do that today. Uh, certainly have it for the next couple of Sundays if you want to join us for that. Um, and you may want to study along as I invite all of you to do as well uh, in these coming weeks. Be reading through Mark's Gospel chapter 13. The story in, in chapter 13 that Mark tells, um, he records a lot of conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples, those first friends of his, the closest ones to him in particular. And he talks in such a way that for us today to read this story, this conversation that he was having, and in particular his answer to a couple of questions that his disciples asked, it's very easy for us to look way forward, way forward as in to think about the end times. One of the reasons it's easy to do that is that I don't know what it is in your Bible, but in my Bible there's a heading at the beginning of chapter 13 that mentions the signs at the end of the age. And so it, it makes us think that way. On top of that, interpreters really for the last hundred years or more, um, some have, have begun to think and focus heavily on the end time prophecies. And we're going to read about that in Mark 13, which is kind of odd. You don't think about reading of end-time prophecies in the Gospels. We think of that more in Daniel or especially Revelation. But language is used in, in this story, in this answer that Jesus gives. And it's easy for us to just immediately go there in our minds. I want you to resist that this morning. I want you to pull back and hear the conversation between Jesus and his disciples as if it was taking place at that time, speaking about that time. We're not going to get into how it might apply to prophecies because I don't read it that way and many interpreters today are, are beginning to go back and say maybe this doesn't have to do with end time prophecies quite like we thought it did. I'll explain more of that as we go along as well. So again, I invite you to turn Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. It's helpful to you know, if you're studying this, that 13 really could be read in the context of Mark chapters 11 and 12 and 13. These three chapters in particular capture the conversation and the events that were taking place when Jesus entered Jerusalem. This is Mark's telling of it. Now you can find this in Matthew and Luke as well with a little different angles. But in Mark's Gospel, he begins in chapter 11 to describe Jesus entering Jerusalem. And not long afterwards, he begins to have encounters with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. Where all of this eventually leads is that Jesus has come to Jerusalem as the climax of his ministry on earth. The climax in the sense that Things had really gotten off track. Things were going in the wrong direction. And you may remember from early in Jesus' ministry, he began to call everyone that was hearing his teachings to repent and be baptized. And we know about repenting. Repenting means to turn. Turn back from your ways. Turn in a different direction. It's a little bit where we get our name, Church 180. Going in one direction and realizing you're in the wrong you're not going in a helpful direction, turn around and go the other way. That's sort of the, the idea that's happening as Jesus enters Jerusalem and begins to confront the people of God, in particular the leaders. And what he's trying to get them to realize is that 
the, the people in general and his disciples is that what has become of the synagogue, what has become of the temple, which was supposed to be, originally designed to be, the key or the center of their existence. This was where God's Spirit resided. This was where they were going to encounter God. This was to be the center with the sacrificial system and the prayers that were offered up on behalf of all people of God. This was going to be the center of their lives communally. And so it had a huge impact and a huge significance or importance to the people of God, the Israelites, the Jews. The problem is Corruption had gotten involved. The leaders had begun to co-opt, so to speak, the purpose and the mission. And they were adding different regulations and stipulations. And you get stories like the, the widow who was, had put in her last two mites. two mites, two coins. What's that all about? Well, one of the reasons <coughs> Jesus is highlighting that is not just to say, hey, good for her, she's... She's keeping the giving front and center. More so what he's trying to, to point out is how wrong it is for someone to have to spend their last dollars on buying indulgences, if you will, to use language much later on. These were things that had been put on the people, and this was not at all God's intention. It's just one example. There are a number of others where the, the religious leaders had begun to set themselves up as a sort of power that they didn't have. And they were getting leading the people in directions that the Lord didn't want them to lead, to be led. In addition to that, there was even corruption in the sense that they were, they were in some ways in cahoots, to use an old language. They were in partnership, wrongfully so, with the, the Roman government. And so there's a lot that Jesus needed to correct. That's the background of these stories, and in particular what we're going to look at in chapter 13. The people of that day saw the temple as a, a, not just an important spiritual place, but a magnificent building. It was known for them, it was known to be the, the largest, the most grand building in all the world. Whether it was in all the world or not, at least it was for that vicinity, anywhere that they would have traveled. It was a place of, of, well, it was a, a marvel to be seen. Not completed, but what, much of it had been completed, and it was a, just a remarkable place. So keep that in mind as you hear this language, because the disciples, like all the others living at that time, really marveled at this place. They were in awe of it. And that's what, where we start off this morning in, in chapter 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, and the other disciples, one of them said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Nothing unusual about that. As a matter of fact, they were probably looking for Jesus to give some commentary on, yes, how wonderful it was for them to have such a place in their midst. How this separated them, set them higher in a position of, of of envy in some ways, or at least a position that was admirable to all the other cultures around them, because this was the place that Yahweh's Spirit resided. Not at all what he says in response. Do you see all these buildings, to reply Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Every stone will be thrown down. Imagine being a disciple having this image in your mind of this grand place and hearing the one you believe has been sent to rescue and deliver from pagan rulership such harsh words, such a prediction that the temple was going to be destroyed, not a single stone left. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, again his closest disciples, asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Again, put yourself in their place. You can imagine that as they're wrestling with the implications of this prediction Jesus has given, their mind starts to go where ours would. When we hear a shocking prediction, 
totally unexpected. What do we want to know? When's it going to happen? Mm -hmm. And is there going to be any indication, any advance warning, anything that we'll see and know, oh, this is getting ready to happen? Same with the disciples. And then Jesus says this, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he, and will deceive many. Now keep in mind what he's talking about there is what I said earlier, his whole purpose for being in Jerusalem was was to confront the religious leaders that were there, confront those who were supposed to be representing God and his way of, of being and his way of, of life. Yet they were perverting that. And so Jesus himself comes as the Messiah, the Savior, the Deliverer, the Corrector of all that had been taught erroneously. So that's what he's talking about when he said, many will come in my name claiming I am he false prophets. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pain. Now that we've read this, if you weren't familiar with it before, maybe this brings it back to your mind and you, you maybe understand what I meant when I said we're all, we often read the, this language, these words, and we think of end-time prophecy. It's interesting, though, that Jesus says in the middle of verse 7, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. If we listen carefully, he'll give us several clues along the way that this is not talking about way down the road. It's talking about something that will happen perhaps in their lifetime. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must, be, must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's the reading we're going to focus on today. Again, I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but know that that's the part we'll cover today. Unless the Lord changes direction, what I'm anticipating talking about next Sunday is verses 14 through 27. So you can study that for next Sunday if you'd like, or for the next video you'll get a, have an opportunity to see. And then we'll do the remainder of the chapter in the following week. So what are you hearing? What are you hearing with the background I've given you? What are you hearing in this conversation? As the disciples are hearing Jesus' words that don't seem to go at all with what they expected about this grand place, this center of power in their, in their people group, and Jesus' response. Does anything strike you in particular this morning with what he's telling them? Basically, he's giving them a 180. Basically, he's giving them a 180. And they're, <clears throat> as best we can tell, they're thinking of Christ as the um, ruler that's going to overthrow Rome and overthrow, etc. And Israel is going to regain its former glory. That's right. be the center of power in that region, if not greater than that. Sure. Uh, and what he's saying is, a, the temple is going to be destroyed, yeah. and you all are going to suffer. Yeah, uh, you know, there's no, you're not going to be in power. You're going to be the least of these. That's you're right. Get dragged into the courts and persecuted, etc. Yeah. So that's that right. had to be a, a wrenching. Wait, what? Yeah. Shocking. Heart wrenching, as you mentioned. Perhaps terrifying. 
a difficult message to hear. Let me follow up with that, whether you answer that or someone else answers it. Why would they be drug through all that was to come? Why would they why would they be included? Why would Jesus be warning them? What was the what was the reason or what were the reasons that they were going to find themselves on the outside and not in favor with the powers that be? Because history repeats itself. Say more about that. Um, in the sense that he's telling them, this will happen to you, mm. but it also will happen to the faithful throughout. throughout. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And the reason for that is well, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, wanted to stamp out not only in Christ, they wanted to end that movement. That's right. They didn't want anybody who'd been associated with him to have any voice whatsoever. That's right. He was a threat. Obviously, to have someone as recognized as he was by the people coming in and, and them cheering and celebrating him, and then for him to speak against not only the building being destroyed, but by implication, all of their power structure, all of their importance being destroyed and wiped out. Well, if his followers stayed faithful to his message, if they continued to carry out the same message, obviously they were going to be the center of the opposition and the brunt of all the animosity those officials would would cast out, cast toward them. It's interesting to me anyway that as he's talking about them being hauled into court, if you will, taken to the synagogue, mistreated, flogged in the synagogues, which is another way of saying punished publicly, and arrested, don't worry about what to say. It'll be given to you. Don't worry about beforehand what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit who Jesus would send after his death and resurrection would give them the words to testify about him. Just before that, he gives the clue as to why. Why the Spirit would be so involved in even such things as defending those disciples. Verse 10 says the gospel must be must first be preached to all nations. In other words, before these things were to occur, before this, this destruction, the gospel had to be preached. And the verse right before. And the verse right before that? He says, you will be a witness. That's right. Oh, because of me as a witness to them, you'll be hauled before kings and governors and rulers right. as a witness. It's not going to just be private witnessing. This is going to be public witnessing. If not intentionally, then against their will in court, so to speak. <clears throat> not against their will because they wouldn't want to share. But let's face it, if they're hauled into court because of the witness, then to further the witness is probably only going to confirm the punishment that's coming. Perhaps that's why Jesus is saying, out of his love and care and provision for his, his disciples, the Holy Spirit will not only give you what to say, he'll empower you. That's a powerful word for us today because you're correct. This is not just a word for them. It's in our scripture. It's in our Bible, and this is instructive for us today. As we continue to live and move and, and work and, and go about places that don't necessarily hold the same values that we do, that don't necessarily follow the same leader that we follow, we too are called to witness to who he is. Many times that witness is going to be for the good of people, people who are struggling and suffering, and today we often think of our witness in that way. But the truth is, there are those in the world perhaps even in our society today, that don't want to hear of another power. They don't want to hear of a power who is not going to support their own self-centered and selfish agendas. 
but it's going to uphold the agenda of the one who created everything. And there will be punishment. There will be persecution. There already has been. You will see that um, um, when the first Christianity took out, I mean, was launched and the disciples branched themselves out and were making witness to other people. How the Roman uh, gover government took many Christians to the arena. That's right. And was, they were killed by lions and such and stuff like that because of their faith. That's right. Then you will have also the first martyr, martyr in the Bible, I mean, the New Testament in Acts. Right. That got killed. That's right. Because of what he believed. Steve was. Yeah, Stephen. 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 That's right. But one thing very, very good in here that, that I read when I read in Acts, he said that many of them, he was still preaching and telling them, and many of the people that were there was, don't say anything else, don't say nothing else. That's right. That's what you will say right now because some of them don't want to hear. That's right. That's right. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear. They objected to it, and they were trying as fast as they could to kill him to silence his voice. To silence his voice. That's right. And yet, what also took place in that event, Paul, a seed was planted. Yeah. Paul. And arguably the greatest missionary <clears throat> in the rest of the world to ever live, the Apostle Paul, was standing there watching and witnessing. So the prediction Jesus gives here comes true. Mm -hmm. In that example and others. And the idea is for that to continue to be the case today. It's interesting that he says brother will betray brother to death. And a father and his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You know, I'm grateful that we don't see the persecution, the opposition to that degree in our society. But we see it in other societies today. It's definitely in places in other parts of the world. And there's no reason for us, we, we, may, we may take comfort in the fact that it's not here, but there's no reason for us to believe that it can't ever come. And this, in such, in some cases, mm. it's in here. Right. Because the way that uh, kids are behaving and to the parents, they're killing him, killing them slowly. Yeah. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually. That's good insight. They're killing the parents. That's slowly. right. That's right. And it's very disheartening to hear reports publicly that even in our school systems, some school systems around the country today, there are ordinances being passed or trying to be passed that would prevent the schools from even informing the parents of what's taking place with their minor children. So the warning is real. As we are called as Christians to continue to take forward the life-saving and the life-giving message of Jesus, a very hopeful, encouraging message, the warning is real. Be prepared. Those who have a self-centered agenda, those who have an agenda against Jesus as Lord, will also oppose his messengers, you and I. It's a stark warning. And if you read the end of this, the very last phrase of that last verse in, in 13, Jesus gives this warning, but also this promise, this hope. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. There's a whole lot behind that one <laughs> phrase. Obviously, someone is watching. Someone who has the power to save us. Maybe not in the trial that we're going through. Because Jesus has told us, you'll have trouble in this world. But eventually, we will be given the life that he came to give us. That's hopeful. Because the reality that you already know and I know and anybody we might ever tell about Jesus knows, 
there is trouble in this world. This world has rebelled against a good and kind and compassionate, life-giving Lord. And when that happens, we deal with the consequences. And our world is very much broken. And the good and the bad, we all suffer because of it. And yet Jesus reminds and encourages, stay true, remain faithful. Friends, this is a message that, that I need to hear. And it's a message that you need to hear. But it's also a message we need to teach our children, our friends. And as we give the life-saving message, this hopeful message to others that have not heard it, we need to remind them, hey, it is a wonderful message. But there'll be trouble because of it. Not everyone wants to hear it. It is much like in big cities today, that's where we commonly think of it. If you have a gang, a gang that's stereotypically bad and out for themselves and causing a lot of trouble for the, the community in which they operate, and one person stands up against them and says, it doesn't have to be this way. Stop doing what you're doing. There's a better way. What do we expect to happen? Can you tell it? They take him out. <laughs> Why? Because he's opposing their agenda. It's important for us to hear that today, and it's important for all Christians to hear that as we begin to celebrate the season of Advent. Because what we're really celebrating is the first coming of Jesus, the coming of our Lord. But even more, we're celebrating in anticipation His return. We'd love for that to happen in our own lifetime. But it may not. That may come sometime much later. But the Lord calls us, even here, to remain faithful, to stand firm. It's important for us to encourage each other and support each other in doing so. But we have to know it in order to do it. Is there anything else that strikes you about this passage? Particularly as we celebrate the Advent season. Um, when he says we will be testimony, uh, and when you were uh, saying, you know, being a Christian and following Christ, have the troubles and the tribulations or whatever the thing is, we are a testimony to people who doesn't know Christ. That's right. Because a lot of them says, how you went through that? That's the first question they ask. That's exactly when right. When they know you have been in, you know, in, in a big loss or right. uh, you have been in a, a, a dealing with someone who's very sick or whatever problem you have been and you come out. Right. And you still come out, you still during the pro the trouble has been happy, has right. been serving God, have never said, why me, or God, you know, whatever the, some people come with. And those who doesn't know Christ, the first question they ask you is, how you did it? Yeah, that's right. Or how you doing this? That's right in the midst of what you're going through. That's exactly right. You know, we, to go back to the illustration of the example of, of the game, we see these things in movies, for example. And what do we do when the one person stands up? Whether it's adult gangs or even it's bullies at school and a kid stands up for another kid. We cheer them. We cheer them on. We do, we get excited. Yes. We're, th we're excited because it's good news. I don't know about you, but I'll just tell you, there are moments and there are days when I look around at all that's going on, all that has changed, break and sadness and evil that is in our society, and it gets me down. And I wish it would just go away. It's not going to go away until Jesus comes back. Not going to go away fully. But just like what sometimes happens in those movies, 
when one stands up, even if it costs him a beating, isolation, a loss of his possessions, hauled into court, or killed, we cheer. And what you often see in those stories is true. What that one person suffered may inspire others to have the courage to step forward and stand up for what is right. We need to hear that today. We need to be reminded of that today because we as Christians are called by the one who is over all and is in all, who is powerful enough to bring about eventually this change, has called us to be a part of it. That's a part of what we celebrate even as we prepare to receive our Lord the second time. You remember in, in the Gospels, that last night, he was with these same friends. Jesus told them what he had been telling them. This is the cost. I'm going to be sacrificed for you and for many. All those who would believe, all those who would pick up my mission, who would pick up my cause, who would take up their cross, he says, and follow me. This is our calling as well. And so when we celebrate communion as Christians, this is what we're celebrating. We're celebrating the Lord of life, the Lord who created life himself, the Lord who only, only him can give you and me life forever and life that is good life that is rich life that is true gave up his life so that we could have that life and because that love that he has that that powered this gift can't be contained he's called us to share it as well that's the gift we celebrate at christmas that's the gift that God sent into the world. That's the gift we prepare to receive and to share with others. This is what we're called to do, even at such cost. And we need to be cautioned. We need to be warned, just as they were, of the things that will take place in between. As we are bringing about good, as other people are benefiting and being blessed as we have been from hearing this good news and turning and following this life-giving Lord. The enemy, the ones of evil, are going to stand against it. But we have to persevere. We have to stand firm. There's a lot of good news in this story, even though we hear of these difficulties. Jesus was telling this story and the, the rest of the passage that we'll study in the next couple of weeks because he knew eventually his way would be vindicated. This would stand as a testimony to what he said was true. Friends, as we, as we celebrate communion, as we gather to worship the Lord, as we come and go in all of our dealings in life, our comings and goings, this is the central calling for us to remember. We are a part of God's bringing about new creation, which is good. So be encouraged today. If you want to be a part of a cause that ultimately wins, a cause that ultimately blesses all who will receive it, a cause that has no better cause as an alternative, this is it. I hope this message is encouraging to you and to those who watch by way of video because as we celebrate this year and as we look toward the coming of Jesus the second time, we have a lot of reason to be hopeful and a lot of reason to persevere. In the name and for the cause of Christ, amen.
Thank you.